and thank you, Pastor Zeb. It is a it is a real privilege. It's not just cursory words. It's a privilege to be in your pulpit. Thank you for sharing your pulpit. Many pastors are are, are stingy and they're afraid to share their pulpit. And, and thank you for the trust and thank you for the friendship and thank you for everything you've done for us since I've known you. You are a gift to this congregation. You are the right man at the right time for the right church, for the right season. And the Holy God is with us and we praise him. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit. And Father, first and foremost today, our main objective, our only objective, is to lift up and magnify the name of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah to the risen Lamb of God. We praise your holy name. Jesus, help us to decrease today. You need to increase. We need to decrease. Get us all off the throne of our life and you be the master, the ruler, the Lord and the Savior. Father, I pray today that you would give me the gift of teaching and preaching today. I'm just a messenger boy. I'm just a messenger with a message from God. And as Pastor Zeb said, I pray, Lord, this finds fertile soil in our heart. I pray, God, that the Holy Spirit would cause us to be attentive to the Word of God. We know, Lord, with your Word, and your Word says, your Word will never return to you void or empty without accomplishing its purpose. Father, we praise you, we love you. I pray that this church is built up and edified. Strengthen us, Lord, for the seasons ahead. We look forward to the day that you call us home. But until then, you told us to occupy until you come. You told us the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. In Isaiah 6, he says, Here am I, Lord, send me. That's my prayer, Lord. Here am I, Lord. Send me into the harvest. Use me. Ring me out. Let the latter days of my life, the last days of my life, be the best for you. Ecclesiastes says the end of a matter is better than the beginning. So, Father, this service is for you. This sermon is for you. This message is for you. But also, Lord, use it for your people. Comfort where comfort is needed. Strengthen where strength is needed. And Lord, your word also says that you will not take the bruised reed or break it, and if there's a burning flash, you will not extinguish it. If there's anyone here that has just the tiniest bit of faith left, I pray, Lord, this message encourages them to lift up their heads, square their shoulders, and know that with Jesus Christ, we are much more, much more than conquerors. We praise you and we love you. And your holy name we pray and for your sake. Amen. You know, the Bible is for you and not against you. Do you understand that? It's the inerrant, infallible, inspired word of God. Inspired in the Greek is theonostos. Theonostos means God breathed. Are both of these mics on, Bob? So there's no echo? Okay. I hear the echo sometimes. Do you know that not only is the Bible for you and not against you, God is for you and not against you. Many people think that God is just always so angry up in the sky, and I, I came from a Catholic background, and, and I never had assurance of salvation. We were always taught that when you sin, you go to hell until you go to confession and communion, but if you sin after communion, you're going back to hell. And there was never no assurance because there was constant sin. But then I realized someday, July the 10th of 1983, that Jesus Christ died on a cross to take all of my sins cumulatively. And he took them all and he paid the price. And my hope of going into heaven is not by being good, adhering to the commandments, going to church, serving soup at Thanksgiving. My hope in going to heaven is what Jesus did. And that's your hope too. If you're trying to earn your salvation, the Bible says in Galatians chapter 4, you are severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by the law. You have fallen from grace. So your only hope, 
my precious friends, I love you so much. Your only hope of eternity where you can lay down at night and know where you're going is in Jesus. It says in 1 John 5, 11 to 13, and this is the record that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Those who have the Son have life. Those who do not have the Son do not have life. You're lost. You'll be in the hell that everybody is so terrified of. The tragedy is everybody in hell, their sins were paid for, but they never gave it to Jesus. So for those people, his death was in vain. And John ends that in verse 13. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. Romans 8.32 says, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Now, when your heart's broken, is that one of all things? Is it? When you're afraid of the future, you may lose your job. Is, is that something concerning to people? Don't we need a job or we'll be homeless? Sure. Grief, sadness, anything, sickness, whatever you need, we have a God that promises. He promises. He says, I'm not like a man that goes back on my word. He promises to meet your needs. And more than often, he gives you a lot of your wants also. Turn with me, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and I have a message entitled, The God of All Comfort. Brandy, can I have that water, please? I'm so sorry. This is totally out of order. This is my beautiful wife, Brandy, the water girl. <laughs> Thanks a lot. The God of All Comfort. Mm hmm these scriptures are so true. All scripture is still on us loss. All scripture is God breathed. All scripture is profitable. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. I always teach and preach out of the NASB. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies. Look at that word, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our affliction, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. As Pastor said, this will be about God and suffering. This message, tr listen, trust me, is not about me. I'm just a messenger boy. It's not about my son. It's not about my grandson. It's about God. It's about God. But before the subject is even broached before we can talk about it. Look again at the words, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is so important. Remember this scripture, remember this verse for just a little bit later on. Blessed is eulogitos in the Greek. Here's what the inner linear says about eulogitos, blessed. This is important, get this. Well spoken of, blessed as entitled to receive blessing from man, worthy of praise, is only used of God the Father and Christ God the Son, showing the Godhead is worthy of all our worship. Indeed, only God is inherently praiseworthy, deserving every good acknowledgement, and that is 2128 in Strong's and is only used for God. That particular Greek word for blessed is man's word to bless God. We are so used to receiving God's blessings to us. God desires we also bless 
him. How do you do that, preacher? Follow along. Don't fall asleep. I, I preached at a church one time. I've been preaching 38 years. Cross my heart, you can't lie anywhere, especially in the pulpit of Zeb Thomas. <laughs> I'm preaching. Here's how this started. We're going to take a time out. So I go to the church. I preach there many times, and the, the sound man's gone. That's always a worry for me. I want everything to be perfect. Everything has to be meticulously perfect, OCD in the noggin. There's no sound man. So this guy says, I used to, I used to run the sound booth. I says, oh, okay, you, you good with it? He says, I don't know. It's been like 25 years. So they don't do no mic check. They don't do nothing. I stand up in the pulpit, and it's a cappello. What do you say without a microphone? I don't know. It's like it was just me. There was no, there was no microphone. And, and so you got to go through. You got to act like you've been there before. Until about 25 minutes into the service, there were four guys in the very back row. <laughs> they were old timers. Remember Eutychus in the Bible? Somebody was preaching long, and what did Eutychus do? Got out the window and killed himself. Don't nobody die back here. One of my best brothers of all time, I got to recognize him. He hates it when I do. Joe DeMarco has been my longest friend in my life. I love that man with all my heart. And, and, and what, a, what a choice servant. I, I, I love you guys so much. I love everybody here. It's so good to be around friends, isn't it? Mindy and, and Pam uh, McVeigh and I used to do VBS. Remember those days? I got a picture of Mindy. Pam, me, and Pastor Floyd. Fun, fun days. If you don't have enough VBS volunteers, volunteer for it. You will have a fun time, but you won't go to sleep at night because your head's still stir crazy. You're hearing voices and stuff. Let's get back into the message. So, before any suffering, after any discussion of any suffering, we can only say, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because nobody else can compare with God. I want to share with you something amazing. And, and I have to do this. I'm going to be very careful. Well, it's only quarter after 11. We will beat the Presbyterians and the Baptists to the restaurants today. <laughs> I never finish early, but I won't finish too late. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, this is an important prayer. And I want you to, everything I say now, the comedy part's over. We can all relax. This is going to get a little bit intense now. But follow this. I hope you learn something that you always remember. And in 1 Samuel chapter 2, 1 and 2, then Hannah prayed and said, My Lord, or I'm sorry, my heart, exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth speaks boldly against my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. Watch this. There is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one beside you, nor is there any rock like our God. Now, rabbinically, this is one of the most important prayers in the entire Bible, and they still repeat it to this day. It's actually read at the Jewish celebration of Rosh Hashanah. And that is 10 straight days of reflecting on the, the goodness of God, the greatness of God, how mighty he is, how powerful he is. And yet for 10 straight days, it's also, listen, 10 straight days of deep repentance for their sins. There is no one holy like the Lord. That's part of the prayer. And the Hebrew word for holy here is kadosh. Pastor Zeb, thank you for the good plug on Wednesday morning. We have a lot of fun, but I taught one week on kadosh. And, and that, is the Greek, that is the Greek. Kadosh is the Hebrew, the Hebrew word for holy. And listen to what it means. Separated and far away. So when Hannah prayed that prayer that there's no one holy like our God, what she's saying is God is so far away. He's so separate from us. 
that there's no comparison with us. There's no comparison. He's totally different than us. And we're totally different than him. God is kadosh. Isaiah 55, 8, 9 bears this out. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So the word kadosh there really brings that out. If anyone thinks they're anywhere near worthy of God, they're not because he's kadosh. But listen to this. Those of you who have, who have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, His Holy Spirit now lives and rules and reigns within you. So this God who's so far above us that His ways are not our ways, His, his thoughts are not our thoughts, He's so distant, He's so great, He's so wonderful, He's so holy, He's so perfect, Yet when you receive Jesus Christ, not only are your sins forgiven, God looks at you not as that you're not guilty, God looks at you through the shed blood of Jesus Christ as if you've never sinned at all. And so he can make his abode within you. And he's promised us because he says, I'll give you the Holy Spirit as a pledge, as a down payment as a promise. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you, declares the Lord God. Amen. And that's only for people who have recognized that they're sinners and all their good things they're trying to do and their self-righteousness, well, they're trying to throw that to God and compare that with the death of His only begotten Son on the cross. No comparison Away from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. So if you have Jesus Christ and you say, you know, I'm a sinner, Lord. I am so sorry. Because without repentance, there's no forgiveness of sin. Scriptural. I'm so sorry. I, I want to rededicate my life. I, I want to use the rest of my life for your glory and for your honor. Please forgive me for not loving you with all my heart, mind, soul, body, and strength and my neighbor as myself. Forgive me for selfishness and pride and, and lust and ego and whatever else we sin. And you pray that sincerely and you ask the Lord to forgive you. The Bible says, he who comes to me, I will no wise cast out. That's a beautiful promise from Kadosh. From so far away, so separate, that he is the peacemaker and he wants to be with you. And he's also... He's going to be with you as the God of all comfort. Because guaranteed, the Bible says, in this world, you'll have tribulation. You will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, Christ has overcome the world. Matthew 28, 20, Jesus said, And behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. In 1 John 2, 15 to 17, the, oh, this is so easy to do now. Do not love the world. How in the world, how in the world can anybody love this world? Excuse me. How can you love such an evil, God-hating, wicked world where babies die? I, I, every day you read the news, something more horrific. I read the other day a two-year-old drowned in an open septic tank. Little 13 year old girl stabbed 114 times by a guy who just wanted to go what it like to kill somebody. Somebody's daughter, butchered. How can anybody love this world? Bible says we're citizens in this world. Bible says, Bible tells me we're just passing through. The Bible says our life is a vapor, is a mist that appears for a moment and then it's gone. Right? James. Right? If our life is just a vapor and a mist that appears for a moment, what part of your life is devastation problems? Just a small part. Boy, it can, it can cause you to fall deeper into the cross. 
or it can cause you to fall away into the world. You get to choose. God's for you. Devil's against you. You cast a deciding vote. 1 John 2, 15 and 17, Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but it's from the world. The world is passing away, and also it's lust. And the one who does the will of God lives forever. All these are sins that cause the death of Christ. That's why God says, don't love the world. Christ died for every human being, from Adam and Eve to the last baby born. Christ died and, listen, cumulatively took all the sins of all humanity. I can't even comprehend that. And he was perfect. He's God. He's Kadosh. He's so perfect. And yet he came as a baby, lived as a perfect sacrificial lamb of God, a perfect man, the second Adam and allowed himself to be crucified. We'll talk about that in a few moments. And he took all the sins from noon till three, when it got dark, every sin that you've ever committed, every sin that anyone in this church has ever committed cumulatively, every sin that was ever sinned from Adam to the last baby, Christ, the Holy Kadosh, God, took it all upon himself because he loves you that much. God is for you. He's not against you. Don't run from God. The Bible's for you, not against you. Don't neglect the Word of God. So now back to 2 Corinthians 3. I'm going to look at 3b to 4a, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our afflictions. Now, pastors have correctly said that you either know this in theory or, or in practice. And, and I have to get personal now, but I promise you, I promise you that I'm going to do my very best with the Holy Spirit's help to bring God all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. My grandson uh, Samuel and, and granddaughter Sarah were born three, two months premature on September the 29th of 2020. Samuel has passed. He's with Jesus as of Monday, May 17th. He was declared at 740. He lived 231 days. Sarah, thank the Lord Jesus Christ, is, is wonderful, fine, just a blessing. They were twins. But Samuel was never healthy. He had four major surgeries in his first two months. The first surgery was eight and a half hours, and, and I, I think he was one month old, and I thought, I'm downstairs now that the, the children's hospital has a NICU camera. And each baby has its own pass name and password. It's not the child's name. It's a, it's a fictitious name and a password. And you put that in and on your computer, on the PC downstairs in my laboratory where I create sermons and study the Word of God, I always watch Samuel from from birth until the end. And I was watching him get prepared for this eight and a half hour surgery, and then the camera goes blank. It says the nurses are caring for your child. So I'm crying. I'm, I'm not boasting here, but I'm just telling the truth. I'm, 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 I'm very tough, was a boxer. You can't knock me out. There's nothing, in my, nothing but concrete up there. But I'm very, very sensitive, I'd say weak, emotionally. When I watch this memorial thing, I, I, I start to tear up. I say, you can't, you can't cry before you go preach. But I see those warriors dying, and now people are like hating our flag, hating our country, want to be socialist. American soldiers died against socialism and communism. What kind of world are we living in? Don't love the world or the things of the world. But... I'm real sensitive, and, and I, I'm crying. I know that Samuel's just not going to make it. No, no baby that's on a ventilator can make it. And during this time, when we're waiting for that eight and a half hours, Matt sent me a, uh, a, a, a message, and it was Maranatha singers singing in his time. 
man, did I cry. I'd be embarrassed if you saw me. My gosh, it was like a flood. But it was joyful tears. It is time. He was always oxygen starved. He, he had this oxygen starvation feeling that he's suffocating because he was. They ran out of places to put the pick lines. All of his veins collapsed. Uh, at the end, they were alternating temples, with pick lines in his temples. He would need revived by CPR up, up to seven times a day, they would have to bag him. He had recurrent eye infections, staph infections. He had trach infections almost every two weeks. Pardon me, Andrea would go over every single day, never missed a day. Matt, my son, would go over every single day, sometimes twice a day. He would constantly either read the Bible out loud over Samuel or pray or both. And he would stay three, four, five hours. It was wonderful. And for 231 days, the staff at Children's Hospital watched and listened to consistency, faith in God. We were all praying for, for Samuel's healing, but toward the end, we were praying that God's will be done. Dee, who I cherish with all my heart, Charlie and Dee are the, among the most choice Christians I've ever seen. We talk on the phone, and, and she says, Terry, I don't even know how to pray, honey. She says, I, I don't know. I, should, I don't know if I should pray for the Lord to take him home because he's suffering so much. I says, I recognize that, Dee. I don't know how to pray either, so I'm just praying God's will be done. This goes on, but over a thousand people were praying. Now, listen, over a thousand different people were praying. That's a lot. But he went to heaven, and he's now completely and forever healed. We prayed for healing. He's healed. Of all the things, I'm not talking he's just healed of his physical ailments. Yeah, he's got a new glorified body. But do you know that he will never, ever, in all of eternity, know what it feels like to purposely sin against a holy Kadosh God? He died without ever having sinned against holy God. Thank you, Jesus. And my grandson never sinned purposely against you. But his death was just awful, horrific. It was terrible. All his days were suffering. There was, there was tears in his eyes. But any baby's death is awful, terrible, horrific. Children's Hospital... They were so good. On the Sunday, the docs told them that one way or another, Samuel was going to pass on Monday. They did everything they could. He had been medically paralyzed for a few weeks straight. On and off the last few months, poisons had accumulated in his body. His organs were failing. His heart rate would go as high as 300. And I said, are you sure it's not 200? He says, the nurse is here. It's on a monitor. He took a photograph, 300 beats per minute. A baby, because when they unparalyzed him, he was suffocating. His lungs, the bronchi, were not getting the air into the lungs, and his heart was beating faster and faster, trying to get air, and, and so they had to paralyze him so his heart didn't explode. And they put it, they had a trach in there, but the problem was he was growing bigger. I think he was 10 and a half pounds, and his lungs were, were that of a... I don't know, I can't remember what they said, but the lungs were too small to sustain him. While he was paralyzed, he wasn't able to receive food or water through his feeding tube. I, I could never understand that. I, I didn't understand that. He, w he was bloating. Unparalyzing him was almost certain to stop his breathing because his lungs just couldn't bear the extra heartbeat. He had that pulmonary hypertension. So at 4.54, he was unparalyzed. We're watching this on the NICU. It's, Matt told me it's not going to be long now, so we're watching Samuel. They put Samuel in Matt's lap. They unparalyze him. His arms and legs start 
like going like this. You see a doctor's hand shoot a syringe of morphine into the baby's temple, and he, and he stopped moving. But Matt kept kissing him, like every 15 seconds. Now I'm watching this, and I'm watching my son hold his son. Now I had to take a pause here. When I was a little boy, when I was told about death, I remember it made me cry so hard. I, I couldn't believe, like, I mean, don't laugh, but when, when I told my mom I want to meet Curly from the Three Stooges one day, she said he's dead. That's how I found out about death. What's, what's dead? Well, they're gone. They're out of this world. You can never, ever see them ever again. That's all my mom at that time knew. I knew she believed that there was an eternity, but she, if she told me that, I don't remember it. I don't think she did. So I think death is never seeing somebody you love again. So all my life, when I had children, I had Matt in 85 and Amy in 87, and I was always pathologically fearful that one of my children would die and I'd have to outlive the children. And that's why I have such a special respect for any of you, and I know who I'm talking about, who have outlived your child, and you still love Jesus Christ like you do, and you have the sweetest spirits, and I praise God for that, because that's only supernatural strength and help from God to get you to this point. Great is your reward in heaven. 454, he was unparalyzed. Matt kept kissing him. Andrew held him. Matt held both of them. It's he never stopped praying and kissing Samuel. And then Matt was holding him as he died. So Brandy told me this. I said, I, I can't imagine this. And, and I'm crying. I'm, I'm inconsolable. And Brandy said, instead of dying in a bed, Samuel was being held by the two people, pardon me, the two people that he knew that loved him. And he went from Matt's arms straight into Jesus' arms. He wasn't laying in a bed alone with nobody around. Matt just bent forward and held him and, and kept kissing him over and over and over and over and over. He later told me that he wanted to give him so many kisses because down the road he'd want to give Samuel kisses who wouldn't be able to. So those were stored up kisses. He was held for about 20 minutes, and then the docs took him. There were seven doctors in the room. Five of them were for Samuel. One was for Andrea, and one was for Matt. Me and Brandy watched this whole thing, and the precious little innocent baby died. What, what I call gruesome death, because it's always gruesome if a child dies, but it took him two hours and 46 minutes to suffocate to death. When I'm watching my son hold his son, and it's hopeless, he knows he's going to die. He's a Christian who's prayed and fasted, and many, over a thousand people have prayed and fasted, and Matt's looking into his eyes, because he took a photograph of Samuel's face an hour before he passed, and Samuel's eyes you, you can't describe the, the, the face of the baby. To retain his dignity, I won't do that. But my son's watching this for two hours and 46 minutes. And it just killed me. It, it feels like nothing that can be described. Because I can't help him. My job is to help and protect. Watching my grandson die is such a hard death also watching my son have to endure that. You get all this real good. Get it clear in your head. Watch how this ends up. Why did this happen? Nobody this side of heaven's going to know. We, we don't have any explanation. The very worst pain I've ever had, it felt like I was going insane. I mentioned on that Wednesday morning Bible study, now this is the truth, uh, Brandy will bear this out. I've passed 14 psychologicals in my life. She says, why do you tell people that? They're going to wonder, why do you have to take so many? 
and they're job related, I'm not insane. I know what the doctors want to hear, and you do too. But I actually felt like I was going insane, and I like guns, and, and I have a 45 in, in a place in front of me. Not that I'm scared of parent, I just like having them around like a teddy bear or whatever. And I have a CZ-45 behind me. And, and I heard the enemy say, shoot yourself in the head and end your pain. And I said, at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee shall bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The voice stopped. Because Satan has to bow his knee and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Every tongue means every tongue. Then I heard the voice say, just put it up to your head. And I said, in the last days, Satan will be cast alive into the lake of fire where he will be tormented day and night forever and forever. I haven't heard a voice since. I could pass the 15th psychological. But seriously, the hardest I've ever cried. Matt made the funeral arrangements. We, we brought them supper. My daughter Amy was there. He showed us Samuel and Sarah's room. Samuel's stuffed animals, his clothes. Matt kept smelling them over and over. He said he wanted to get Samuel's scent one more time. It's called the funeral home. He lives in Houston called Speakman's, McElveen Speakman's. I said, Matt, you sure you want to have him there embalmed? It's a memorial service, but you want to have him there because every time you pass that place, you're going to remember it. He said, Dad, I definitely want him there because that's five more days I can be close to him. That's the last five days I'll be close to him. Now, again, this, this old guy here, he's crying his eyes out. Matt co-officiated with Pastor Kurt Jenkins, and I can't, I can't thank Pastor Kurt and, and his wife Sharice and Central Assembly enough for their hospitality. They bent over backwards. They, they were more than loving, more than accommodating and I appreciate it. And all the cards we got from you guys, and all the prayers and phone calls, and, and all the messages, you don't know what that does. That's balm, that's, that's strength for your soul. That's the Holy Spirit using you to comfort somebody else. So now that we've been comforted, we can try to comfort other people when, when they need comfort. That's what Christians do. It says in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you fulfill the law of Christ. So I don't remember the funeral. I only remember looking at the casket. It's, it's about two feet wide and white. This teddy bear was there, a little wind-up fishy thing where he used to like it. it. It would glow blue, and it was fake water, and these plastic fishies would go around like a, an aquarium, and he, he, he would follow it. Sometimes his little arm would go like he was saluting it, and it was so heartbreaking. But I, I don't remember... I don't remember anybody speaking. I know Matt spoke. I know Amy spoke. Uh, Pastor Kurt spoke. They said I spoke. I honest before the Lord don't remember anything that anybody said. I do know that my son, God gave him the strength to co-officiate his own son's funeral. It was unbelievable. I have no idea what anybody said. I, I wish I did. I couldn't remember who was there. I know staff from Children's Hospital came, I was told later. After the service, Matt carried the casket from the front of the pulpit out to the hearse. And then we went to the graveyard, and from the hearse, he drove, or the, the hearse drove to the graveyard, and then Matt took the casket from the hearse and, and laid it at Samuel's gravesite. And listen. The only way any of this is even possible is if you have a real relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. It's impossible otherwise. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to God the Father but through me. And when God says that, that's God's rules. I see no exception there, do you? I don't. John 14, 16, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another, he shall give you another comforter 
that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be in you. Oh, there's this holy God. He's Kadosh. But once you become a Christian, instead of having Jesus beside you every single moment of every single day, you have Jesus' Holy Spirit inside of you. Ordering your steps. The Bible says the steps of a righteous man are order to the Lord. The ways of the, ways of the Lord can be your ways. You, you bow your knee and ask him to be Lord of my life and Lord, take control of my life and guide me, use me, make me a holy and useful vessel. Use me for your service. Help me to win souls. Help me, Lord, to do whatever you want me to do. Here am I, Lord. Send me. That's a Christian's attitude. A Christian's attitude isn't like where, where you come to church every other Sunday, every third Sunday, you tag and, and you hope that when you die, you, you know, God looked at that and, and gave you a seal of approval, grading on a curve. No, it's a lie of the devil. If Jesus is your Lord and Savior, listen, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. The real Christians go to church. That's just the way it is. Me, Brandy, Matt, Andrea, Amy, we choose to believe God. We choose to trust him at his word. How could you not? He's been so faithful. We've trusted like many of you have. But it says in first Tim or Second Timothy chapter one and verse two, I know in whom I have believed. I am confidently persuaded that he's able, able to he's able to keep that. Some translations say, guard that which I've entrusted to him until that day. Till what day? Till the day we're home safe in heaven. And we understand 2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 4, so much better now that we've gone through this death of Samuel. We'll get more on that in a second. But we understand this verse. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Father of all mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our affliction. You're not left comfortless. If you're grieving, listen, you can, you can call a pastor. That's what, that's what we're there for. You can call friends. That's what we're there for. But you first have to call upon God. He's your Lord and Savior. He's your strength. I don't have the strength to give you. The only strength I have is from God. God can use us to comfort each other, but the greatest comfort is going to come from your Lord and Savior, Jesus, because as much as we love each other, nobody loves us like the Son of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the one and only God, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, Behold the Lord, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Nobody loves you like God. Nobody. Affliction is persistent pain and great suffering so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. See, it's real to us again because God proved himself again. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 8. We are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair. God's word really is true. That's a fact. Samuel wouldn't want to come back here. And I wouldn't want him back. I wouldn't want to take somebody out of heaven. What's heaven like? Well, the only thing that we know about heaven is that the Bible says, I has not seen, ear has not heard, neither have entered into the heart of man. That means all the collective imaginations of all mankind cannot conceive of the things that God has prepared for those who love him. So it's, it's going to be outstanding. Instead of concentrating on Samuel, and, and look, I, look, I look at his pictures every day. Even though I'm preaching, we got the victory, we're human, we still cry. I still cry. I look at his pictures, and, and, I, and I, I see the whole life history and, and I see how he got older, and, and I see how sick he is, and, and then his deathbed. And, but if I think of that, I start going insane. I don't think of that. I don't look at Samuel as a loss. I look at Samuel's gain. 
gained eternal life with Jesus Christ. We are so eternally grateful for all the prayers of the people who remembered us in prayer. Again, I have to thank you for that. And now, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. And here's the most important part of this whole message. Now, this part here will tie everything together, and I pray in Jesus' name that God give much glory and honor to our Lord and Savior Jesus. And I pray you're edified and built up. Now, let me ask you this. Who comforted Jesus as he was being scourged, beaten, mocked, punched, had his beard pulled out, crown of thorns beaten into his skull, and then crucified and mocked some more as he was dying for your sins. Who comforted him? My grandson died a very comforting life, or had a comforting death, whatever. He was held by his mom and dad. He was morphined. There were, there were five doctors for them, two for the parents. Everything medically that can be done was done. He was comforted. I praise God for that. I thank you, Jesus, for that. But who was comforting Jesus? The Bible tells me they were walking by him, mocking him. In other words, while he was suffering, I can't imagine your, your back being beaten by maniacs, demoniacs, until, like, you're scared so bad you're nearly dead. You've been sucker punched, beat, beard pulled out, thorns smashed into a skull, nailed to a cross in front of his mother and his friends. And the Bible says in Matthew that people were walking by wagging their heads. What that means is Jesus had to push up oh, to try to get some breath. And it was so excruciating. And they're down there mocking him like they're, they're making fun of the one who's dying for their own sins. While we were enemies with God, Christ died for us. I hope some of those mockers repented. And when they go to heaven, it's like they never sin. Because Jesus paid their... As far as the east is from the west, Though your sins be as scarlet, they can be whiter than snow. Don't let your past haunt you. You give it to Christ. Who, who comforted the Father? As he had to watch his only begotten, holy and beloved son die like that. With all the sins of all of us on him. I was watching my son hold his son. And I'm just a sinful human being. And it broke my heart. And I'm a sinner. What must Holy Father have been feeling since we were created in the image of God and we know scripturally Jesus wept. Scripturally, God created us to be in his likeness. So while God the Father was watching all the sin be dumped onto his holy son who had never known sin, and God hates sin, and God had to turn, instead of comforting Jesus, God had to turn his back. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That's what Jesus cried out. And it means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As much as God loved his son, as much as God loves his son, let me correct that, as much as God loves his son, he had to not help him, had to turn away from him. For all of us, for me and for you. If he would have helped him, we'd all be going to hell. God loves you that much. God is for you, not against you. The Bible is for you, not against you. John 3.16, For God so loved the whole world that he gave his one and only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Romans 5.8, But God shows us his love in this, 
and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I think I have a little bit better understanding of the greatest ever of all sacrifices now. I, I think I can see a little clearer now how the Father must have been just, I don't know if I can use the word with deity, devastated, but what was it like to turn his back on his only beloved begotten son? And Jesus dying had his father not help him. He had his father turn from him because all of your sins were put on Jesus. And he was dying for you. God is for you, not against you. And so after all this, God proved his word is true. Once again, God kept us from falling. And I love these next scriptures. Listen to this. I'll read this one out of the New Living Translation. It's a dynamic equivalence. I, I use formal equivalence, NESV, ESV, but this brings it out really, really well. Psalm 103, 17, But the love of the Lord remains forever with those who fear him. His salvation extends to the children's children. Philippians 3.10, that I may know him. I love that scripture. We did a Bible study uh, a month or two ago on that very verse, that I may know him. That, that little section there, we did a, the, the class is from 10 to 11, but we never ever end at 11. 11.15-ish, 11.35-ish, in that area-ish. But we did a Bible study on Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, that I may know him. This should be easy for every believer to say, easy for every believer to mean. One of our most sincere desires should be to know him. Remember, Jesus says in Matthew 7, many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord. Remember the rest of this? Haven't we prophesied in your name? Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out many demons in your name? Lord, Lord, didn't we do many mighty works in your name? And he says, I will say to them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you workers of iniquity. Those are the worst words to hear. I think that's the worst verse in the Bible. That's the scariest verse in the Bible to me. I mean, it goes along with cast alive in the lake of fire where you'll be tormented day and night forever and forever. Current knowledge of God is never enough for a real Christian. The current level you're on is never enough for a real Christian. You always want more. You always want to know God more. You always want to study the word more. You always want to apply it better. You want to memorize it. You want to hide God's word in your heart so that you may not sin against him. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 to 18. The Bible says, for momentary light affliction. Now, time out, pause right there. When I read that, I wrote, what, what do you mean momentary light affliction? How can affliction be light? Why did God, why is Theonostos right there light affliction? And then it came to me. Compared to what Jesus went through and how God suffered watching that, what we go through is light affliction compared to what Kadosh did for you for you and for me. For momentary light affliction is producing in us eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison while we look not at the things which are seen but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal but the things which are not seen are eternal. That's great. So now do you see why 2 Corinthians 1 verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our affliction, so we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. He really is a comforting God to those who put their trust in him. In closing, now, Tiff Shuttlesworth is one of my favorite preachers of all time. He was my neighbor. Um, I can't say enough good things about him. I don't want to steal. I don't like to brag people, but I love people so much. I don't want to brag him up and lose his boards, but he's one of the greatest preachers I've ever heard.
rather than focusing on our loss, we look at Samuel's eternal gain. Samuel didn't lose his life. He gained eternal life in heaven with the Holy God. And Tiff always says, thanks to the gospel, we'll see him again. Oh, I stole that. I love that. I always tell people that are saved, when somebody dies, it was lost, I don't say it. Too bad, too horrible, too deceived. There are so many people in this world that think you can live any kind of life you want, no affiliation with any church, let alone any affiliation with God. And the family automatically thinks that it's like an escalator. The next step is you're in heaven. Nobody goes to hell. There's only one person in hell, maybe two, Adolf Hitler and Charles Manson. Because everybody thinks, well, they're, they're better than Hitler, so they're not going to hell. And, and you hear that so-and-so became an angel of God. Samuel's not a little angel. God doesn't need little angels. Angels are powerful messengers. Angel means messenger of God. Samuel and nobody else turns into an angel. We've, we've had people tell us three or four times. Brandy had somebody in her family say that when their mother died, they were doing the dishes after the funeral, and a monarch butterfly kept tapping the window, and she said, oh, there's a sign, Mom is alive, and Mom's telling me she's good. If we die and we go to heaven and become butterflies, you see how stupid this is? You see how God is mocked by the enemy? You see the enemy comes to John 10.10, he, listen to me, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy your soul. He hates you. And while you're down grieving, he'll stomp a mud hole in you and try to get you to kill yourself. He hates you. God is for you, not against you. The devil hates you. He wants to trick you and deceive you. Samuel is alive in heaven. We're going to see him again. In just a second, we're going to be reunited. The life he's experiencing with our Lord and Savior in eternity far surpasses any good that he or any of us would have experienced in this fallen world. Thanks to the gospel, we'll see him again. I love that verse. I love it. Was this easy? Well, let me ask you this. Was this ever easy for any of you who went through it? Will this be easy for anybody else who goes through it? Every parent wishes they never go through it. But Matt is strong in the Lord. This is the ninth time I've preached since May the 17th. I want God to use me all the time. I, I used to preach a lot more before my dementia and my, my balance issues. I slowed down a little bit, but I said, God, I want my end to be the best. I want your word never to return void or empty without accomplishing its purpose. I pray, forgive me for my sins. Cleanse me from my unrighteousness. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Your word says, if you then be an evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? All you got to do is ask. And He lives and rules. Kadosh is with you. He's with you. He's for you. He's not against you. Just because we teach truths in the Bible and the Word of God doesn't mean we don't cry. Pastor Zeb will tell you that we all preach a better message than we can live consistently. The target is the Word of God, but we sometimes fail. And what we do when we fail, we get up and we keep going. We keep going. But know that through prayer, the study of God's Word, the prayer and love one, the prayer of people that love us, other believers, we Christians can be sure of constant inward supplies from God. We need it comforted. You prayed for us. You sent us cards and messages. You called us. We were comforted greatly because of you, because of God. Does that make sense? God is the great provider. Philippians, Tiff also, bless his soul, used to say in closing, how many times, Brandy? Ten, she said, roughly. <laughs> in closing, in closing, in closing. In closing is meant to grab your attention. Okay, you're, you're thinking about where we're going to eat. And in closing, you, you come back to the sermon. But Philippians 4.19, this is so true. This is so true. How can we stay, listen, how can we stay home with our head underneath the pillow, crying and having a, just, just having a hissy fit? 
How does that glorify God? Well, I want Samuel's death to bring God much glory and much honor because God is worthy of much glory, much honor, much praise. He's worthy of us. It says in Philippians 4.19, And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. No matter the need, God is greater, isn't he? No matter the need, God is greater. God is greater than your need. 2 Corinthians 12.10, For when I am weak, then I am strong. Do you know why? Because when you're weak, he is strong. I mean it. When you're weak, he's strong. Lastly, Romans 8.31, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Amen? I pray that touches you. I pray that you understand that there is a God who's so far greater than all of us that he, he desires, dare I say desperately, enough to have a son crucified, I guess that's desperately desires to have a real relationship with you. You can know him. You should desire to know him. And you should live for him. And when you fail, you confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive you for your sins, to clean you from all unrighteousness, and he'll put your feet on the rock. And when you're on the rock, nothing can touch you. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you receive glory and honor from this message. This preacher here thanks you for helping me through this and giving me the words, the anointing, the unction. I love you with all my heart. I'm grateful for Samuel's life and Sarah and my son and my daughter and Paige and Brandy and my Pastor Zeb and all my friends here and all my Christian family. I pray that you bless them. I pray everybody in this church, every Christian that ever helped us in any way, ever, I pray your hand of blessing and favor and protection upon them. I pray you draw us all closer to you so we can have a better relationship with you. Lord, help us to store up treasures in heaven. Help us to walk in your spirit and avoid the lust of this world. Keep us, Lord. You told in, in Genesis 12 that it was you who kept the king from sinning, and you can keep us from sinning. We pray for more of your Holy Spirit, that you would fill us and use us so we may comfort others, edify and build up the body, and most of all, bring you glory and honor. We pray these things in Jesus' holy name, and for his sake, amen. Thank you so much.